It's almost time. You know what I'm talking about. You know what I mean. It's almost time to pay your stupid f***ing bills. It's time to spend $780 on your phone bill because you went over your allotted minutes because you were certain that the phone sex operator would leave his job and come live with you and be in love with you if you just talked to them every night after work for three weeks. Alas, things didn't turn out how you wanted and you're freaking out because you don't have $780. Does this situation sound familiar? Yeah, I thought so. Well, worry not, you stupid idiot. You don't need to worry about huge cellular phone bills anymore. Introducing TradePhone, an innovative new cellular phone billing system which allows you to pay for your use of your cell phone with precious items rather than money you never have enough of. TradePhone uses low-tier, deprioritized, spotty service, which covers almost 8% of these United States. And the best part is that you never need to spend a single penny on your monthly bills. Instead, TradePhone operates on a barter system system. When you get your monthly bill in the mail, simply upload some photographs of your precious items, metals, heirlooms, or gems that you would like to send as payment, and the trusted appraisers at TradePhone will evaluate your goods and tell you which items to send in for that month's payment. It couldn't be simpler. And don't worry about what will happen to your great-grandbrother's silver necklace or your treasured childhood trinket. TradePhone works with a network of old-fashioned smelters and blacksmiths to melt down your items into handsome ingots which you then sold to overseas markets, which have fewer regulations and oversight than those in the U.S. It's a perfect system. Everybody wins. Trade phone. Trade your valuables for cellular service today. You have successfully connected to the Secret Society of Fly Tires podcast. I really didn't want to do this, but desperate times call for desperate measures. I've been forced to put some restrictions in place for you listeners. You guys and very few girls don't look at the podcasting charts like I do, but my show, this one that you're streaming right now called Secret Society of Fly Tires, has just been middling out in both the domestic and international crafts and leisure podcasting charts. And I'm sorry, but I need to do something about it. When you want something done right, do it just now! So, starting today, I will now be requiring listeners of this show to stream each episode five times and log one officially qualified share before the next episode will be unlocked. Don't even try to tell me that that is technically impossible. I know all of you, and I am the only master of my content. So, five full streams of each episode or no next episode for you. Nothing for you! And don't forget to share. Never, never, never! You have to take a screenshot of you sharing the episode, save it as a PDF, print it out, and then fax or mail it to me. This will help all of us, okay? Especially, Especially me. me. Now that I got that important business out of the way, let me tell you that I'm really excited for this episode. I've been wanting to do this one since I started the show, but I've been putting it off because it's my home water and I wanted to do it proper justice. I probably won't do it proper justice, but I'm not even sure what proper justice would mean for this body of water. I personally have kind of a love-hate relationship with it. I'm talking about the Lower American River here in the state capital of Candy Cornia. California. California is California. State of California. California of California. California. Hello there. I'm the governor. Also known as the gummy bear of Candy Cornia. I convinced local guide, fly tire, and casting instructor Andy Gibbard to join me for what is his very first podcast interview to pick his brain about my oh, river. I love it when I get to be somebody's first podcast interview. I've mentioned Andy on the show before. He gave me my first casting lesson after buying my first spay rod and worked at my local fly shop Keeney's for 30 years before they shut down. He's now over at Fly Fishing Specialties in Citrus Heights and guides anglers on his jet boat on our local streams looking for striper, steelhead, and shad, and whatever else might be hungry enough to eat a bug made out of string and animal hair or feathers. I'm very hungry. Give me the french fries. You might also be familiar with Andy from his articles in California Fly Fisher Magazine. 
His fly tying recipes were featured in that publication on a few occasions, and he always had a poetic way of running through the steps of building whatever fly he was talking about. Sadly, like Keeney's Fly Shop, the magazine's now gone. Anyways, Andy's You Name It fly could be called legendary for us local Sacramento area anglers. I'll get into more detail about the Lower American River, Andy, and his fly patterns in just a minute. But first, I guess I need to update you all on my mission to quit cigarettes. I failed to provide an update in episode 30, and to be honest, I did that on purpose because I have been mentally fighting myself to the death about quitting for this entire third season of the show. That's what your brain does to you when you're addicted to something and it has been fighting me and tricking me for years now. In fact, I even took a break from working on the show after I finished up episode 30 just to elongate my smoke time. Do not bother me during my smoke time, okay? That is my time, and that is probably why it's been so hard for me to quit this time around. I get very little me time as a father of two with a full-time job and a podcast. Life can really make you feel like a urinal puck, just pissing on you and spitting on you. That sounds erotic. And then that smooth, rich blend of imported tobacco swoops in to save the day. You see how twisted this is? My brain has pranked me into rewarding myself with something that definitely makes me look and feel very cool, but it's actually killing me slowly, quickly draining my meager bank account, and definitely setting a bad example for my children. I don't want them to smoke. This is the tipping point in my mission to quit. I'm past the halfway mark in season 3, so I need to end the kicking and screaming and complaining about quitting that I'm doing and actually start the process. I hate it, and it sucks, but that is what I promised myself I would do, so I'm going to do it. I'm making an example out of myself for everyone listening. Really feeling like I shouldn't have told you guys about this, to be honest. I should have just rambled more about aliens and giants instead of including this segment in every episode. But like always, I've made my bed. Now I have to piss in it so I don't want to curl up in its warm, smoky embrace anymore and go to sleep. Really? You peed the bed again? No, that guy broke in our house again. Okay. I'll tell you what, I have smoked a lot of cigarettes on the American River, but I pack out my waist like a good angler. There are many anglers on the American River that refuse to do that and leave way more garbage than a cigarette butt on the banks or in the water. This is an inherent problem with most likely every metro river. It flows through the city, and that means there's more trash and more people that don't give a shit. I actually think you should give a shit. I've definitely come across my share of needles, piles of computer duster cans, bags full of batteries, full coolers full of rotten meat, and tons of other stuff while out exploring the American. I am not the type to tell anyone what to do, but I would sure love it if the anglers that leave their garbage at the river would knock it the hell off and stop making every other angler look shitty. No one knows which one of us leaves that trash at the river. They just see a pile of monofilament or lure packaging or a styrofoam cup of worms and blame all of us. Pick up your trash. Pick up your trash. I wanted to ask all of you listeners out there a small favor. Please don't let it. It makes you look dumb. It stinks. We did a whole episode about this with Brad from Project Litterbug, remember? I don't know why anyone has to say this anymore. Plus, you earned some fish karma. I pick up more trash on my way back from fishing when I don't catch anything, hoping selfishly that Mother Nature will notice and reward me next time I hit the water. It starts out making you feel mad because you're picking up other people's stuff, but then it makes you feel good when you throw it away. Anyways, that's the end of my high and mighty rant. I had to start there, because that's one of my biggest issues with the American River. It's peak trash time here too, as summer's starting up and that means more people are on the water. Summer on the American River also means it's time for my favorite run of fish that my local water brings, the spawning migration of the American Shad. It's kind of the only real run of fish that you can count on as an angler on the American in my opinion. Sure, we have steelhead and salmon and a hatchery at the Nimbus Dam that helps sustain them, but they are by no means coming close to the numbers our area used to experience. Veteran anglers love to wax poetic about the old days here, where the salmon were so plentiful you could basically walk across the thick film of fish eggs and cum they created by making love all day to get to the other side of the river. Do you remember the good old days? I believe that was a sensual reality at some point, but it's declined significantly. Salmon season was closed for the 2023 season, and I believe it will be closed again in 2024. Although I do not believe anglers are the biggest threat to the species, the closure has seemed to help overall numbers. It's not just on the American River, I believe it's been a full west coast closure. Removing one variable has helped. We've also had more water the last couple years, which I hear is something fish need. Steelhead are elusive for most of us. People definitely catch them on the American, and sometimes they catch big ones. The hatchery strain is from the Eel River, and those fish can get really big. 
I would encourage any local anglers that haven't gone to the hatchery during the fall to go see the monsters that make their way up the fish ladder. It will absolutely get you more stoked on hitting the river that really doesn't have that many fish per mile these days. Anyways, the river has steelhead, king salmon, stripers, suckers, pike minnows, lampreys, and American shad, which is what I was talking about before I got sidetracked there. I only knew of shad as a lure pattern to catch bigger fish before I started fly fishing and had no idea people caught them for sport or how big they could get. I was also foolishly unaware that they fight hard for their size, which tops out around 6 or 7 pounds. That is a beast of a shad if you're ever lucky enough to get into one that big. My buddy JD Ritchie refers to them as mutant herring, and like me, shad are made up of 90% bone. Native Americans referred to them as inside out porcupines, I think? Someone or some people refer to them that way, and it's true. They are an oily, bony-ass fish. Maybe we should call them Italian shad. Hey! Oh! Hey! Oh! Forget about it! Hey, can I ask you something? Well, what's forget about it? I'll stop making self-deprecating jokes relating myself to this fish I like so much, but I really like them. The first fish I ever caught on a fly rod was an American shad. The first fly I ever tied was a Bloody Maria, so I could go catch some chat. It's an important and already nostalgic fish for me. If you aren't familiar with the Bloody Maria, I will link to a tying video in the show notes. It's a simple fly pattern developed by local shad master Jeff Ching that is usually tied on a size 10 hook. Choose your colors. They might all work at different times. I feel like a little flash or UV helps. I don't think too hard about it, and I don't think the shad do either. They just get annoyed at whatever is invading their space while they're spraying their semen and eggs all over the place, which is what they really do, all jokes aside. It's what biologists call broadcast spawning. If humans try to broadcast spawn, we go to jail, but fish are allowed to do this. Jeff also posts an almost daily report on his shad exploits on the Keeney's Fly Shop message board, which I am very thankful survived the store closing. Unlike steelhead fishing, no one really guards any secrets about how they find success with shad. There are plenty of fish for everyone during their summer run up the river. I was just about to type out a story about one of the funnier moments I experienced while out fishing for shad one summer evening, but I realized it's one of those stories you kind of had to be there for. I'll give you the short version anyways. A man and his lady were floating down the American on some type of inflatable, and the loud, mean-sounding lady ordered her man to pull over so she could piss on the shore. No, no! When he finally did, right at the gravel bar that I was waiting off of, she stomped over behind a big rock to do her business and emerged with a newfound happiness at finding a giant fish. She happened to be pissing right next to a large and very dead shad and thought it would be a good idea to bring her catch back to the inflatable so they could float it home for supper. The loving couple argued about it for a little bit before she got mad again and threw the fish down and stomped back onto the raft, allowing only me to appreciate their situation. These are the joys of metro fishing, okay? I'm sure you guys have your own similar stories. I am thankful to at least have a river that holds some amount of fish basically in my backyard, and it's one of the main selling points of visiting Sacramento, if you ask me. We have a bike trail that follows basically the whole Lower American River, with access points dotted all along the way, some free, some paid. And it can really feel like you aren't in the city in some places along the parkway. It can be far enough away from traffic and people that you can fool yourself into thinking you are nowhere near civilization. Sacramento has good food, and the river, and bike trail, and not much else if you ask me. I love to complain about it, and I wish I loved it, but I guess I only like Sacramento. I like you. Like. I like you! People come to Sack of Tomatoes, that's what us locals call it, for big ass striper, that's for sure. But those traveling anglers more than likely target those fish on the lower Sacramento River and in the Delta. Striper definitely chase the shad into the American this time of year, but I think more people look for them on the lower Sac and in the Delta. My guest, Andy Gibbard, guides for them. So do SSFT alumni Chuck Reagan and Hogan Brown. So does local striper master Maury Hatch. You have plenty of options. If you do come to Sacramento to fish, hit them up. Or hit me up and take me out on your boat for free, please. It's the least you can do after I typed up this episode. I mentioned good food. Go to my favorite not cheap sushi spot, Crew. They refuse to serve bad meals. and I've never had a bite of food that I didn't love there. Same goes for my pal Ben's Pizza Shop, Pizza Supreme Being, which is way more affordable but just as delicious. 
We have a lot of Mexican food here too. I prefer Taqueria Maya. I also love donuts and we have two really good spots, Marie's and Stanley's. I daydream of opening Fisherman's Donuts if my broadcasting or commercial pitchman careers don't pan out. Speaking of commercials, I have to confess that I am contractually obligated to air all the fake commercials that the worm submits to me. Hey, everybody. I usually have no input on the creation of these ads, and I have no editing power either. Every once in a while, I make a specific request, but these are usually sent to me without any prompting. The rules are, you have to do what I say. But if you don't, I will look for you. I will find you, and I will kill you. Please excuse this brief word from our sponsor. Have you ever had that kind of Captain Crunch cereal where instead of the gross yellow squares, it's all delicious colorful orbs? I have, and it's great. It's called Captain Crunch Oops All Berries, and the fine folks over at Eglin's Best have taken that idea and applied it to their line of farm fresh eggs. Introducing Eglin's Best Oops All Shells. These state-of-the-art eggs are truly a miracle of science and technology. The biologists over at Eglin's Best were able to breed a line of chickens that lay eggs that are just shells. I don't mean that they're like a normal egg with the innards sucked out. These babies are solid shell. They're not hollow. They're normal sized eggs, but it's shell all the way through. And let me tell you, these masterpieces are truly delicious. Everybody knows that the most delicious and nutrient rich part of the egg is the shell. Sure, the yolk lobbies have spent millions of dollars trying to trick us into thinking that the yellow slime inside the egg is the good part, but that's nonsense. Real egg aficionados know that the shell is the only part of the egg worth eating. Eggslin, Eglin, Eglin's best oops all shell, Eglin's Eglin's best oops all shells get rid of the useless innards and give you all of the outards. These shells are thick and brittle and they taste just like normal egg shells. It's just that you get so much more shell per egg. I don't understand how they made these freak chickens lay these awesome eggs, but they did and I'm thankful for Eglin's best oops all shells eggs. Find them now in your local grocer's egg section or order them online. Just head on over to eglinsbest.com shell and use code inbreeding for a free Oops All Shells sampler today. Eglin's Best really went above and beyond with this one. Not only did they breed chickens that lay eggs that are just shell, but they also applied the same selective breeding techniques to turkeys, ducks, geese, barn owls, and a huge black lizard that I don't know the name of. They wouldn't tell me the name of the lizard when I toured the facility a few weeks ago, but I did get to try one of its Oops All Shell eggs, and it was magnificent. Thanks, Eglin's Best. Thanks for making breakfast the crunchiest meal of the day. It's part of our contract. He prepares the ads, and I air them. I will put a bit of music behind them to bring them to life a bit, but the content is non-negotiable. Sure, they are definitely getting weirder and longer, and they all seem to be about pigs or milk or penises, but that fits in perfectly with a fly-tying podcast, right? Yes, it does. I'm not sure if you get the same publications in the mail that I do, but this show was recently featured in Pig Informer magazine and was voted as the podcast with the most hog-related fake advertisements across all podcasts on both the Apple Podcast Network and Spotify in North America. I don't know how to segue this back into the American River. I'm usually so good with segues, but not today. It's okay though. I'm about three pages deep in size 11 Helvetica font into typing this monologue and now is where I start petering out with my rambles. And I default to some basic history and geography related to the river. So let's do that so I can paint a better picture for you. I'll ramble more later. This is pieced together from sacriver.org and theamericanriver.com. The Lower American River watershed begins at Folsom Dam, which is right near the prison everyone knows about because of Johnny Cash, and flows 30 miles to its confluence with the Sacramento River near downtown Sacramento, which Oprah made famous because of her expose on the ever-increasing homeless population here. Folsom Dam creates Folsom Lake, which provides flood protection for the Sacramento area, water supplies for irrigation, domestic, municipal, and industrial uses hydropower, recreational opportunities, and maintenance of flows stipulated to protect fish and wildlife. Flows from Folsom Lake are captured by Nimbus Dam and re-regulated before flowing through the floodplain and urbanized Sacramento area. The Lower American River watershed is valuable to the region and beyond, with more than 40 species of native and non-native fish documented in the river including fall Chinook salmon and steelhead. Although the river runs through the highly urbanized Sacramento area, the river is buffered by the 30 mile long American River Parkway, known as Sacramento's Jewel, which runs from Folsom to the Sacramento River confluence near the tourist death trap of Old Sacramento. Water quality is considered to be very good. 
It is? That could be debated, but what do I know? I usually talk about aliens and giants, not science. The Lower American River has been designated a recreational river under the California Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. Like I said, the Lower American River watershed originates from Folsom Lake, which was created by Folsom Dam. The dam is located about 30 miles east of Sacramento. During a 24-hour period, the releases of water from the Folsom Dam can vary greatly to meet changing demands for water and power. Nimbus Dam, seven miles downstream from Folsom Dam, stores these releases and re-regulates them to a steady flow downstream in the American River and allows Folsom Dam releases and power generation to fluctuate with daily power demands. Nimbus Dam forms Lake Natoma, located in the town of Folsom. The Lower American River has levees on its north and south banks for about 13 miles from the Sacramento River to my neck of the woods in Carmichael on the north end. Portions of the floodplain have been acquired by either the city or county of Sacramento and is managed cooperatively as the American River Parkway. Just a few minutes ago, I said, or read and relayed to you, that the Lower American River supports more than 40 species of native and non-native fish, and I think I only named six, so I'm very curious what the other 34 are. I'm assuming a bunch of random shit that people have dumped out of their home fish tanks because they don't want to care for their pets anymore. So probably 34 different species of betas and goldfish. Other wildlife frequently spotted along the river include great blue heron, green heron, egrets, mallards, and other waterfowl, western rattlesnakes, gray squirrel, alligators, camel spiders, river otters, beaver, turkey, mule deer, coyote, mountain lions, a dog named cookie monster, lots of bats, and at least one skeleton, me. I am legally a skeleton. I joke and poke fun at the American River, but I am thankful to have it available to me. I'll always have a little soft spot for it since it's where I started fly fishing. I'm also thankful for everyone that I steal from to make this stupid show. I steal lots of content, but I also don't make any money off of it, at least as of the time I'm typing this out, so I don't really feel that bad about it. I use stolen music half the time as background music for these episodes and only just recently started giving that credit in my show notes. I guess because I was scared of some more copyright strikes, as if me saying the name of the artist or song in the show notes was going to raise the alarms or something. I steal all kinds of YouTube content to make my episode trailers. I steal lots of written material to pass along factoids about the subject of these episodes, too. I steal my guests' time and probably my listeners, too. I want to wrap all that up into one big thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Thanks for letting me be a digital pirate and use your stuff to make my very artistic podcast. Please do not turn me into the authorities. I wouldn't last long in jail, and I do not have the money to pay any associated fines. You know who doesn't need to steal from anyone to feel cool? Andy Gibbard. I'm honored that he agreed to come on the show, and I hope you enjoyed two local dudes talking about their little metro river. Thanks for making time to come on the program, dude. Uh, oh, you're welcome. You know, My pleasure. Um, My honor. Yeah, I, I've been taking ca- I've taken casting lessons from you, and I've had a ton of like interactions with you at the fly shop. But I'm looking well, forward. I hope to... I haven't messed you up too much. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> In fact, you know, the, the last rod that I got there, it was a it was a uh, echo. I think it was a TR spay, like a trout spay. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. And you helped me out. You helped me pick that one out. It's been great. So, good, um, you, you haven't you haven't steered me wrong yet, but uh, all right, okay. Yeah, I'm looking forward to learning more about you. You know, and in addition to the fishing advice that you've already given me over the years, and you, you may or may not be surprised to hear that a couple of my previous guests have referenced you too. At, at oh. least, at least one, Jason Hartwick. Oh, good old Jason! I haven't seen him in years. Yeah, I mean he's he's a wizard, and and maybe Hogan Brown too. I, I forget. I, I met right Hogan now. Brown no? for the first time last summer. A friend of mine hired him and invited me to to go oh, along. Yeah. yeah. You guys fished the Yuba or something, or the South? Uh, or... We fished the what did we fish? We fished the Feather River. Oh, cool! I don't know. Yeah. Uh, this is this is your first podcast interview, yeah? Yeah, it is. Huh? I'm honored. You never you never yeah. forget your, you never forget your first. And, yeah, I didn't uh, know if I was going to have a podcast or a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> either, either one, man. I promise I won't get too weird, though. Like, so. Oh, it's all good. Let's start just at the beginning. How did you get started fly fishing? Oh my God! Well, I actually I I fished all my life, but oh, in my late twenties, I was working at Graphic Combi House, which was right next door to Keeney's Fly Shop, and okay. a friend of mine who I worked with at the at the art supply store, went over to Keeney's and then thought I might be a good candidate uh, to work there. And 
I went and talked to Bill, and next thing you know, I was hired. Is, are, are you an artist, too? Uh, yeah, I have I have a degree, an M- M- MA, Master in, in the Arts. Wait, cool. What do you what do you enjoy doing then? Like, what are you painter? Like, what do you? What no, do you I do? don't do any of that now. I can't mm. even draw a stick figure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, now I just tie flies. I've yeah. been in photography. You know. Okay. Wait. Yeah. yeah. So, so you know, fly fly fishing for a lot of us leads into tying. How did it? How did it? You know, parlay into tying your own flies and all that. Well, again, my friend Alan, who first went over to Keeney's, he was an excellent tire from the beginning and pretty much i you know i figured hey i i like that i'll give it a try so i've i've been tying for oh almost 30 years now and had you not fly fished before you started working at the shop no well actually i fly fished for about six months and you, you just uh, started yeah okay yeah i just started but uh you know i, I fished a crap load because i had a lot of free time being mm-hmm. single and and when I uh, was interviewed by Bill Keeney, I said, well, Bill, you know, I I really don't know a whole lot. I've only been fishing for six months. And he said, well, Andy, you've done more in six months than most of my customers have done in six years. <laughs> yeah. And and then I said, well, you know, I, I really have a lot to learn. And he says, yeah. He says, well, here's my advice to you. And I go, what's that? He goes, don't pretend like you know everything and don't let them know you don't. Yeah, that's, that's good advice. So, so Bill hired you there, yeah. Yeah, huh? That's cool. I only know him from the message board and see him posting on the yeah fly shop yeah, message I, board all the yeah, time. Yeah, I was a delivery driver next door at the art supply store. Cool. So, have you? Did you ever tie commercially? Like your? No, your, no, I can't stand tying more than three, four flies at a time. Oh, really? Yeah, you just yeah. like tie, you tie up a few that you want to go down to the river with, and yeah, pretty much. Yeah, you know, I cool. get people asking all the time if if I would sell them my flies, and I I just yeah, it's not my thing. Yeah, well, I mean, you, I've seen t- flies of yours, you know, specifically the your you name it right, and oh yeah, uh-huh. um, I can see why because it's a great fly, and you know, it's the you know the one pattern that I know of yours that I know of yours for sure. Um, can you, could you run down like the material list for that and maybe give it like a brief description or something? So, uh, people, Yeah. You know? Let me think about it. Yeah. Uh, well, basically it's tied with a stinger hook. So I start off with a, depending on the size of fly, I usually mm-hmm. do a 15 to 25 millimeter Waddington shank. Yeah. And then uh, there's an eye, a dumbbell eye, and sometimes lighter, sometimes heavier, again, depending on whether I want the hook to ride up or down or you know the length of the fly so kind of proportional to the length of the fly it has a senyo wire uh running down the shank out towards the back and that's where the hook is and then the after, what takes the most time is making that little uh, armature it's kind of like doing a little sculpture where you build an armature and then you start molding onto that but the rest of it goes real fast. So all you do is you tie in a little bit of flash. There's a little bit of barred olive marabou tied wet fly style. And then there's a little bit of white. Oh, I've used different materials for the belly. Under You know, the underside has, I use fox. I like fox now. I used to use marabou, but the marabou doesn't last very long. Yeah. So I like to use a nice soft white fox material. And then it has a piece of olive squirrel over the top and that's it pretty simple very cool yeah it's a great little minnow pattern and why do you why do you call it the you name it well people would ask me what do you catch with it and i would just say you name it yeah, you name and it. They, yeah and they would ask me where do you use it and i said the same thing you name yeah, it, it. So i thought you know what i'm gonna call it the you name it <laughs> yeah i i thought maybe it was like you name it what kind of fish you would catch because it's it's very versatile you know i mean like yeah it pattern. is yeah yeah um I kind of imagined, like in my head, I like imagined you getting sick of tying like clousers and stuff, and like well, it's still ba- you know? yeah, well, you know, it's still basically a clouser. Yeah, it's in that same platform or whatever yeah, it you is. want to say. Yeah, yeah. pretty yeah. much. It, it's a jig. I mean, Clouser didn't invent the jig; he just yeah. made it usable on a on fly gear, and it became his 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 clouser. So. Yeah, it's a sweet one. Would you have yeah. you ever you ever thought about tying it on a tube? You get into 
tube flies at all? You know, I, I never have gotten into the tube thing. Yeah. I think about it and I think it would be fantastic as a tube fly. Yeah, I agree. I've been, I've been just, just recently getting into it over the last few months, tying on tubes and stuff. And I think that one would work great. Well, we should get together yeah, and man. show me how to tie one up. I'll bring the materials and we'll yeah, do it. Let's do that, dude. That'd be rad. What What other patterns that have you come up with that you're proud of? Like, what other one? What other of your like kind of signature stuff do you fish a lot? Well, you know, I, I be honest, not a whole hell of a lot. I I have a a fly I used to call the striper caviar, which is actually based on Dan Blanton's Sarmo Mac. Okay. I like how I like how mine looks more, but but it's based on his fly of you know, I I, I don't have anything that I would say is like crazy original. They're all derivative of other people's flies. So I can't think of really anything else other than my you name it that I you know, I really identify with. Yeah, you know, anytime I try to come up with something like total like I feel like it's totally like a t- original idea, it's it's not. And like, you know, it's, 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 totally, it's totally not. And I end up for the most part, just kind of tweaking patterns of other people's that I know, you know, yeah, and, yes. and just make it kind of unique for me. Exactly. Tie it to, you know, to where you're happy with it. You know, that's the nice thing about fly tying. We always at work would tell people, Hey, don't get into this because you want to save money. Do it because you just want to tie a fly and I, yeah. be creative and, and make it the way you want to make it. So you're not going to save money. No, 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 <laughs> unless, not, no, no. unless you're getting paid to tie to tie San Juan worms. Yeah, right. Right. So. Yeah. You know, so I got my I got my first fly rod at what was then American River Fly Shop. Huh? You know, so I, I guess it had a, a was it another name before it became Keeney's? Was it Fly West or something like their Fish yeah, West? It yeah, it went through a whole bunch yeah. of names that I don't even remember anymore. Before they finally realized uh, they should go with the name that's been around a long time. Yeah, I remember going to the shop off of Watt and Fair Oaks, and then the other one on Marconi, and then finally the one over there off Bradshaw. Right. And yeah, you were there for 30 years, I hear. Yeah, 30 years. Yeah. 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 That was yeah, long, about, long time. Yeah, I was, I was <laughs> over there at the you know, one of the final weekends looking for cheap fly tie and stuff, you know, and uh-huh. picked up a, you know, 50% off Lady Amherst tail feather you know oh yeah couldn't exactly really couldn't that. afford on a, on a regular trip you know and oh. uh, and some other little things and i, t- I was talking to alan there and he had, he was telling me that he had been there for 30 years too you know? yeah he was yep mostly yeah. with american river and then about six i forget exactly now six years ago seven years ago it, it uh, merged with american river so and we yeah. moved over to where we last last were so yeah yeah and so i hadn't i I only started to go there back and and got my first rod like i said in 2013 and Mm -hmm. uh december 2013 right before christmas and all that and it was it was surprising to hear how long you know multiple staff dudes had been there you know Mm -hmm. i mean i guess that kind of happens with these shops but it was like i don't know I I was already sad about it, and then I thought about you guys being there for thirty years, and it got me more sad about it. You know. Uh, well, you know, it was really, um, oh, what's the word? You know, it was a, an honor to have served the community that long, and the outpouring of sympathy yeah, that we all got over the last couple of months of us being open was just amazing i mean we've had people actually just break down and and cry yeah, it, it yeah. was really something to see i mean it yeah. i didn't expect that yeah it well it has meant a lot for all of us right here in the local area you know i mean i loved it when you guys were right down the street for me but it's, you guys still because i live out here in carmichael but um, yeah you know i was still trekking over there to bradshaw but you know it's a yeah it was a bummer to see it go you know Change is, oh, well. change is weird change is scary but is yeah. there is, is there any future for the shop like as far as new owners or online store or anything like that or is um, it just kind of kind of done i think it's, it's it's well you never know you know yeah. you know the phoenix could write uh, rise out of the fire who knows but as far as i know it's it's gone <laughs> I can't ima- I can't imagine how hard it is to keep a shop like that open, you know, with the way you, you know, people buy stuff now. I mean, you really are dependent on those kind of you know, loyal customers that keep coming back and right. bring other people in and stuff too. 
Okay. Yeah, it used to be at one time, like American River Fly Fishing Company used to do fantastically online because they were one of the very few shops that jumped on the bandwagon real early and they used, and we did a huge or they i say we but american river did a huge amount of sales online but then as it caught on you just took a smaller and smaller share of it so yeah and then yeah. you're just relying on people coming through the door so anyways it's yeah yeah, I mean, I ordered. I would order online from you guys uh, when I was just late, too lazy to go down there. <laughs> you know, yeah. well, <laughs> we always getting stuff shipped over to my house. Yeah, well, we appreciated every order we got, so thanks. Yeah, no problem, man. Well, so your plans after Keens? I've, I've, I got the newsletter, so it looks like you're planning on kind of devoting way more time to guiding. Yeah. Well, I, I'm going to continue guiding. I, I want to do a lot more instruction. I love, I mean, I like to guide, but I, I really love to instruct. I like to teach spay casting and mm -hmm. you know, all the different uh, techniques. And I am now working part-time at Fly Fishing Specialties. Oh, are you really? Okay, cool, man. I'll come yeah. down there and see you. That's good. Yeah, this week I'm going to be there Thursday, Friday. Yeah, Thursday, Friday. No, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I mean, Anyhow, yeah, so I'm part-time there now. That's great to hear. Yeah, they're they're a great shop, too. They're just, just a little farther from me. You know, you got to go down 80. But now, you know, with with the, with the Keeney's gone, I'm going to be making that trip over there. And they, they have a great fly tying materials. Right? Yeah, they always have. They've, they've had really there. good, you know, they've had really good financial backing there and, and people who really, of course, care about their shop. And yeah. it's always been a really nice shop. Yeah. So. Yeah. Anytime I've gone in there, it's, I've, uh, it's been great. They've been great. It just wasn't my shop was too far. Now it's, yeah. now it's, now it's the only one there. So that's where I'm going. Yeah. 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 So guiding then, what's your focus? Are you focusing on Striper? You know, like, well, what do you do? What do you do? Stripe, Striper has always been a love of mine. It's probably what I'm most passionate about. But before that, it was Steelhead and, and swinging for Steelhead. I, uh, I learned how to fly fish just above Watt Avenue, oh, yeah. swinging for half pounders in the summer. The first time I, one of the first times I went over to Keeney's, he said, Andy, you should go down the Watt. The half pounders are in. I go, what's that? He goes, oh, yeah. those are young steelhead. I said, how do you fish for them? He says, you swing. I go, what's that? Yeah. And he says, just cast it out in the current until it swings back down below you. Take a step and do it again. He's like, you ever fished a, he's like, you ever fished a spoon before? Probably? Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, I used to. I not not here in California. I I mostly, you know, my childhood and my teenage years, it was in Michigan, and okay. so I was throwing plugs and spoons and yeah, spinners yeah. and. So you knew how to, you stuff. knew how to swing. You just didn't do it on. You hadn't done it on a fly rod yet. No, right? no, I didn't. I didn't pick up the fly rod until I finished college. So I was in my twenties, probably mid mid to late twenties, when I learned how to fly fish. Yeah, I liked that run. I mean, I live off Watt, and I liked that run oh. right near the bridge there for a long time. But one of the dicier parking lots, you know, if you're on, up, up, you know, if you're driving on the American River, finding places to fish. So. Well, I, I guess so. I've I've been fishing it for. I mean, really, there I've been fishing for thirty years, and I've I've never had a problem there. I, no, I mean, oh, I've, right. no, I, I haven't. But I, you know, I've I have been broken into in other areas. So. Yeah. Well, knock on wood. Yeah, it exactly. doesn't, ha doesn't happen. I mean, it happens. Who knows? It's always random, right? Really, you, it know, is. you, never, you never know it when will. it's going to happen. And yeah, I hate to give a spot a stigma like that or whatever. I mean, it's not like Watt Avenue is a secret spot. There's a nice. And you can always of... park out on the street and walk in. It's not very far to the river. So true, true. Yeah, you know, there we should probably get started talking about the American River. That's going to be the focus of this episode. And okay. I was I was down I was down at the Nimbus Hatchery on a field trip with my third grader just the other day. Oh, uh huh. And I I've been there before, but I'd never gotten the tour, which was cool. And we, you know, the salmon were were coming in, you know, and going up the ladder, and they were staging out in the river, you know, right below the hatchery too. Tons of them, lots of salmon. It was great to see. Yeah. We got to see a lot of fish come up the ladder and it was fun to pick out the steelhead like amongst uh -huh. the salmon as they're in there and stuff. And right, was, right. 
really nice fat bright ones right and it was making me mad it was making me mad at myself for having like never really gotten into like a really nice steelhead on the on the american river i've i've caught them but not really like a substantial one yeah uh, but have you well, been on the have you been on the river this year a bunch like how are you feeling about this year's run to compared to like the last few years well the the still had the summer run was the best we had in a long time with the yeah. cold water and higher water yeah, we did um, I was most, again, I was mostly striper fishing, but my friends who were out there doing the steelhead thing were doing pretty darn good. And it has slowed down now, but there definitely are, you know, this is a time of the year you, you have the, the winter run trickling through and maybe with this rainstorm, I would think that I'm expecting it to really, really pick up. I hope we have as good a winter run as we did a summer run. Yeah, that'd be sweet. I'm planning to get out a lot more this winter on the on the American here. I didn't get I didn't get out a whole bunch. I only shad fished maybe two or three times. Mm-hmm. And I'm usually out there, you know, twenty twenty five times during the shad run at least, like just going out there having fun in the evening. Well, it, this you know. this year most of the shad run wasn't all that great for people on the bank because it was so high. Totally. Yeah. I went out there trying and and that's kind of, that was the deal. I think I got one out of the three yeah. times I went out there and, you know, I read the, the, you know, locally well-known Jeff, Jeff Ching's report there, you know, on, oh, the, yeah. on uh-huh. the message board. And yeah, it was a little different this year. I mean, I, yeah. I'm, I'm assuming they went through early with all the high water. Well, they came mm-hmm. in early, but there yeah. were shad all the way into July. Oh yeah. Yep. It's just that it wasn't until couldn't get to the end of June or early July when the flows came down that it became more accessible to people who are waiting. Those of us in boats, we we did just fine. Yeah. So yeah, I'm assuming striper fishing then was good too. Well, actually, striper fishing was okay this year. I've seen it a lot better. I thought it would be better than it was. And there there were some little windows when there were some good numbers of fish and and I kind of quit fishing for them on the American in September, but I know a couple of guys were fishing down between Howe and the 8th Street Bridge and doing yeah. really well all through September down there. So real, real low in the river, yeah. Yeah, yeah, which is pretty typical because they start low and they work their way up river. And then usually in August, they'll start working their way back down, and particularly September through September is they're mostly down in the lower river. Man, every time I've gone striper fishing, I've had a blast. It's always been on a boat though. Like I've got, I've gone out with my buddy Ken on 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 his boat in the bay, and and caught a bunch, and went out with Chuck Chuck Reagan on the sack. Uh huh. Caught some great striper there too. I never go out like I honestly never go out on the American targeting them. You know, I I'm always looking for steelhead or I'm out there looking for shad. You know, when in the summertime yeah. and. I, I do catch a striper every once in a while, but a, but as like an ac- accident, like bycatch or whatever, you know, like I'm fishing yeah. for something else and I get into a little schoolie or something. Yeah. But well, could you, yeah. No, you go ahead. I was going to say, you know, what one of the things I like to do is is swing for them with my spay rod. Yeah. You know, one of the times that I took a casting lesson from you, we fished for a minute, like in 20 minutes afterwards, and you were showing me, we were, it was, it was, you know, those striper time on the river when we did it. And you were showing me a spot that you like to swing for them. And, you mm-hmm. know, I totally recommend people taking casting lessons from you. Great caster. And I, I went to you in a, in a weird spot. Like I, I got, I've been fly fishing for, you know, five or six years and felt pretty comfortable with a single hand rod and stuff. And then oh. got the, the two hander and was kind of stubborn about it and like trying to teach myself and looking at YouTube and all that kind of stuff. And, really kind of started piecing some stuff together once I went out with you. So I, I, anybody who's uh, having the same issue or new to spay casting, you know, highly recommend getting some casting instructor for at least a day or two. And if they're local, go on to you. But, yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love, so, love teaching it. So. Yeah. You're a good teacher. I, I, I would say there's, you're, you're walking an even line between like, you know, being tough on somebody and like just being encouraging, which is kind of what I need, you know? Uh huh. So it worked okay. well for me, but so talking about the American river, like, could you go through, you talked about the summer run uh, of mm-hmm. steelhead here. And we talked a little about the timing of shad right now, you know, it's like the end of the salmon run, right? There's like yep. the tail, tail end of it. 
and getting into the winter run of steelhead. Could you could you kind of go through the the different runs of fish that we get here on the Lower American? Yeah, yeah. starting uh, right now, we have the winter run. There's an Eel River strain that was introduced years ago, and the best time for them is late December, January, early February is really kind of prime time for them, though you can catch them all the way in the March. And then come March and April, we get these this other strain of fish that comes in, we like to think of them as possibly, you know, the original strain. They're smaller. The, the right. original fish in this river weren't the big 8 to 15 pound eel river fish, right? They, mm. they were much smaller. And we often refer to them as, what do we call them? Silverbacks? I'm spacing on it. <laughs> oh, bl- bluebacks. Bluebacks. Yeah, That's yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm getting seen out of the other <laughs> But uh, yeah, the bluebacks, and they're a lot of fun. In fact, I enjoy those more than I do the big eel river fish. So the bluebacks tend to hang in the river, in the okay. riffles longer. The the eel fish tend to shoot up really fast to the hatchery. So yeah, so anyways, you can catch those, uh, the steelhead all the way into April. And then by then, we are starting to to ready ourselves for the shad run, which comes in used to come in early May, but the last couple of years, it's been coming in April too. So I would say, oh, the last uh, week or two of April, then you have all of May, June, and at least early July for the shad run. And and then come July, particularly August, September, with September being the prime month, we have our half pounder run, mm. you know, as adolescent steelhead. And then again, and then you have the salmon coming in late September, October, early November, and and then it just repeats itself. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it sounds like a active, very active fishery. You know, oh, there's it, always something yeah. in the river. You know, you can go out there and and you always have the potential to catch something. Yeah, for me, and I from a lot of people I know though too, it's like few and far between. You know, like you have to really, really work for them. Uh, maybe, you, maybe it's you, you know. Well, you do. The runs aren't what they used to be. You know, when I was really lucky when I started, you know, in the early '90s, there were lots of fish. I mean, yeah. my first time I went down for a half pounders, I hooked eight of them. Wow! No shit. And I watched yeah. another guy hook like four or five of them above me. Yeah. And it wasn't unusual to go out and and at least hook, you know, five to ten fish when you went out. Yeah. That's like yeah. that sounds like the the shad run. I mean, that's kind of what got me into fly fishing. Like I really got my first like I fished for, you know, the winter I got my fr- my fly rod and then through the spring I didn't get anything until like the shad run came through and I finally got a fish and mm-hmm. uh, you know, it well, kind of got my confidence up in general and for tying too, because, you know, the flies aren't super complicated. No, they're not. Yeah. No, that's true. You can keep it pretty, pretty, pretty darn simple. But that is the hard thing now for people who are learning is they don't get enough feedback. And it's not that they're doing anything wrong. There a lot of times just aren't any fish where you're at. I like Al Bunch would always say, I'm a really good fisherman when the fish are in front of me. Yeah, right. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, well, if you I mean, don't it, have... No, I was just going to say, it's been a kind of a popular saying that I keep hearing that, you know, steelhead aren't as smart as you think you are, you know, as you think they are. You just got to find them. It's like finding them is the hard part, right? It is. It uh, is. That's for sure. And, you know, people always ask me, you know, well, when should I go? And, you know, should I should I wait till I hear it's good? And I, I like to say, you don't want to be the one getting the good report. You want to be the one giving it. That's a good, that's a good way to put it. You know, you're so not gonna, uh, you're not going to know until you get out. You got to get out there. You're not catching any fish at home either. You know, no, no. And if you see if, you, if you're out there and you see somebody catching fish, watch what they're doing. And yeah, yeah. and don't be afraid to walk up to them and ask them what they're doing. You know, most most anglers out there are, are pretty helpful. There's always a few people who just, you know, they, they'd rather bite your head off than talk to you. But, yeah. Yeah, you but kinda, you, you, know, can, you can tell are. those you could tell those folks pretty quick, and then you just yeah. steer clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I think I've told the I think I told the story on this podcast before. So, excuse me if I did, but like a, my first, what really got me stoked on steelhead in the first place was I was fishing down near Sailor Bar mm-hmm. um, with a, you know like a a steelhead 
a bait cast you'll have set up with a bobber and stuff and drifting jigs or eggs. And I was done packing up, heading out to my car and a guy comes tromping down the river hooked up on a fish. And he uh-huh. was on, he was on like a really, really small kind of like a smaller spin trout rod uh-huh. and pulled in one of those like eel strain steelies and was like, uh-huh. and, and he asked me to like take the photo, take his hero shot for him, like on his uh-huh. phone, you know? Yeah. And I had never seen anybody catch a fish like that there. And it just kind of blew my mind. And especially because he, he was drifting like a little wet fly on a spin rod. Oh, interesting. Okay. And, and kind of and caught this unicorn fish and I was just kind of blown away. So, you know, I mean, the, the going to the hatchery and seeing them there, like I said, it kind of made me mad because I never get into those fish, but it also gave me some like, oh man, I got to get out there. There, there are, there are big fish in there. I got to go find, go put in some work. What, what's your opinion? What is the, what do you think is the, the number one problem with the American river? Oh God. Number one problem. Well, obviously we had years and years of drought, so that was an issue. I don't know. It just seems, I don't know enough about management, but it seems to me when I first uh, started fishing, they the hatchery released so many more young steelhead into the system and i don't understand why there's such a smaller you know smaller ratio of of released fish i i i i i just i don't think they quite get the the stocking that they used to get oh yeah yeah they used to release I don't know, almost twice as many fish every every spring. And, and there was a really big turnaround. Also, when I first started, it was closed for until I think it was like March 1st. The whole river? Very first. It was closed until March 1st. The whole lower American? No, the upper half. Okay. You know, from the power lines up. Sure. Yeah. And I, you know, that allowed... They gave them three, still, three, three full extra months, though. Yeah, of, yeah, of yeah. not being messed with. Yeah. And I think that makes a difference. And yeah, because it opens the first of the year, right? It does. Yeah, yeah. yeah. January first, the whole river's open. You had the power lines that cross the river at Lower Ansel Hoffman mm-hmm. slash Upper River Bend, mm-hmm. and uh, below that is barbless. I'm sorry, above that is barbless all year long, and below it, if you want to fish a barb, you can. Right. But so I don't do know. You, I think it's just just the hatchery management as far as the steelhead goes. I know you know we have such a great local example with the McCallamy. Right. Like, I, I wonder if there's anything that we could learn from that program over there. Well, one of the things I heard and, and you know, and I'm again, I'm, I'm no expert on this stuff, yeah, maybe, but they maybe, have a yeah. program where this take the, the salmon, for instance, that they rear them longer before yeah. they release them. And I'm told by a, a biologist friend of mine that that makes quite a difference yeah. in their ability to survive once they're traveling back to the ocean. When they're dumping a, a larger percentage of them straight into the bay, right? They're bypassing the whole the well, river, they, river, river system, right? They are, but that's becoming yeah. a real problem for the up for the uh, upper stretches of the Sacramento River. Like I was listening to uh, one of the biologists from okay. from the uh, Coleman Hatchery, and it's it's pretty dire up there. They're getting now their eggs from. American rip, they couldn't get enough eggs. So they uh, got them from the McCallamy and they got them from the American River. But I heard they the stipulation was that they had to truck them down. And so in the long run, that won't do the upper part of the Sacramento much good because they're gonna they're gonna go, they're not encoding to to the upper stretches. So it's it's really bad right now. Yeah, well, so salmon's closed all throughout the state right now for for fishing, yep. right? And yep, coastal. Yeah, you couldn't fish for them out on the ocean nor inland. And and oh my God, what it was! I haven't seen this many salmon. I know, I know right? <laughs> in eons. I mean, yeah. it used to be like this, where they're spawning up and down all through the river. And yeah. we saw I mean, we saw spots on the American where there were like 60, 70 
huge ass salmon on reds yeah. and stuff like just jockeying for spots and stuff it was crazy I, I, I i've gone out with guides and stuff on the american four salmon over the last couple of years and and got skunked went days without even seeing one at all during the height of yeah. the run during the height of the run too so do you th- well, do you think do you think the ar would benefit from a lengthy closure then like if you know I, like i, you know, I do i mean i probably you know financially most of us who make our living off the fish you know don't really want to see anything close yeah. but if there was some kind of a rotation you know where a certain river might be you know like the salmon run is is left free to to do what they're supposed to do mm-hmm. I, I yeah i think it could help but i don't know if that's ever going to happen i mean the, the i can't remember the last time that every salmon off the coast that wanted to come up a california river to spawn was free to do so yeah right <laughs> except for what was eaten by seals yeah right? seals and other birds and all the other yeah instead of millions out. being taken by nets and i don't you know i like to eat salmon but yeah me too it's 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 just not that that kill ratio just isn't sustainable anymore yeah. This episode of Secret Society of Fly Tires would not be possible without our sponsors. Are you sick of smoking gross penis-shaped cigarettes all day long? Cigarettes are just thin tobacco-filled wieners if you think about it. I like them. I like sucking the smoke out of the tip, but I know it's bad for me. That's why I stopped smoking and started using Zin pouches. Zin pouches are a discreet adult suckable which are filled with the nicotine and corrosive salts that my addicted body requires. They're cheaper than cigarettes and they don't make you stink like a hog's groin. And you can suck on them anywhere. You won't get kicked out of church for smoking Zen pouches because you can't smoke them. You just suck them. Suck on them while you listen to the priest talk about what's going to happen to you after you die. Pretty scary, right? Not if they've got Zen pouches down there, and I'm sure they do. We all know that the host of the Secret Society of Fly Tires, Margaret, has been bragging about how he's going to stop smoking this season, and using Zen pouches is a great way to transition away from smokable tobacco into suckables. Why don't we check in with Margaret and see how his progress is going in regard to quitting cigarettes. Margaret, are you there? It's me, God. Are you still smoking Siggy Wiggies? You know what? I'm glad you asked. I'm not smoking cigarettes anymore. I'm still using them, but I'm not smoking them. I've laid out a four-step plan to quit, and I'm on step two right now, which is to eat my cigarettes rather than smoke them. I still get the incredible erotic rush from the chemicals inside the cigarettes, but it's annoying and messy to eat them, so it's sort of a deterrent. After two more weeks of this, I'll move to step three, which is replacing cigarettes with Zin brand adult suckable mouth pouches. After that comes step four, where I will use the Zin pouches as sort of a tea bag and I'll brew a big pot of Zin tea each morning and sip on that throughout the day. With any luck, I'll become addicted to that salty nicotine brine and I'll never suck another cigarette again. Wow, that's great to hear, Marge. I'm really rooting for you, and I'm excited to learn that you too are planning to become a Zinfluencer. Zin pouches. Get them today at your local poison shop. Are you a saint or a Zinner? My favorite type of wine is Zinfandel. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna move to Las Vegas. You know, Zin City. <laughs> I'm just having a little fun. If you can think of any other Zin-based puns, please leave a comment and let us know. We'll go through all of them in 20 years and pick a winner, and we'll give you a free lethal injection. Zin pouch. Suck one today. Yeah, I mean, I've uh, selfishly enjoyed the salmon closure on the American just because it's quieter out there fishing myself. Well, that, it uh, is. It's there's, there's less garbage and stuff down there, and yeah, you know, and that's been nice. But I would be, I mean, I would definitely be bummed if my local river. I mean, I live five minutes from it, you know, and yeah, I'm no longer allowed to fish it. And I couldn't fish it. That'd be a big bummer. But we're not that far from the feather. We're not that far from the Yuba. You know, and then we're within a couple hours from Truckee and, you know, Redding and wherever else you want to go. So, I mean, like, there's ways to do it. It would just suck to not have your local thing. But at at the same time, it's like the resources been on such a steep decline for so long. Like, drastic thing, you know, sometimes drastic measures are necessary, right? And yeah, you know, I guess I just don't, I just don't trust the fish need water, right? And like, like we said, like the, the big water year we just had has been super beneficial for the fish that the runs for this year. Right. And we don't know California is perpetually in drought. You know, we don't, we can't really count on 
you know, the water being there, I guess. And then whatever else, whatever else we're not as informed about that happens to, you know? Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I always, am, I always kind of wonder, cause I complain a lot about the American, you know, like, cause I fish it a lot and I don't catch a lot of fish and, you know, it's, it's a river that I can't really convince my friends to come out and fish <laughs> most, yeah. of the, most of the time, you know, they're down to go, maybe go out to the Trinity or something like that, but they're, you know, not as, as into going out on the American. Well, that's particularly concerning steelhead runs. I mean, yeah. we just don't, we don't get the numbers of fish that all the rivers get. I mean, yeah. the Feather River gets way more fish than we do. I, I keep hearing how hot the Feather is this year. Like, Oh, well, it was crazy. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. really crazy. Yeah. yeah, we missed, okay, you know, you have the egg bite. Mm-hmm. And I went up and, and my friend Mark Merrill and I fished with Happy happy when and uh, i mean we still caught steelhead i think we got we hooked eight or ten and the biggest yes. one was about five six pounds and that oh, that oh, yeah. fish was on a size 18 blueing olive oh, wow. they weren't touching the egg and oh, then wow. a week and a half later the egg bite was on and <laughs> i've i heard of some crazy days out yeah. there where people were hooking 30 <laughs> plus steelhead yeah shit i mean hopefully the winter run holds up and i can get out there i got some i got a couple of days off work coming up after the new year and trying to get up there. I don't know that river that well, though. I've only fished it a couple of times. I've kind of gone to the hatchery and then just kind of walked from there and, uh-huh. you know, kind of popped in where the spots were available. It's a kind of a heavy trafficked river. And It uh, is a trafficked river and there aren't uh, a lot of really good spots. In my opinion, there's lots of lakey water. Yeah. And then you have these riffle sections and they're no secret. So yeah, you take your jet your jet boat over there. What do you do? I I I fish the the high flows. Huh. I don't do the low flows, just because it, the low flows are so much smaller. It, it just it it's. I just feel like I'm, you know, pissing people off if I was to fish yeah. the low flows. The high flows, the river's nice and wide. You can get yeah. around. You know, stay away from people and. But, and it's, and, and you, you can catch fish uh, in the high flow, but most of the fish, just like the upper part of the American, that's where they're at. They're in the upper stretches because it's their nature just to keep moving upstream. So what, what, so we're talking about actually catching fish on the American river. Like what flies would you recommend people have in their box? if they're Well, you know, I used to fish so many different things. Mm -hmm. Now I fish personally, I fish two flies. I fish my, you name it, which is mm-hmm. just a, a, a bait fish imitation, olive and white. Mm-hmm. And then I like a black leech. Oh, hell yeah. Andy. But, but there's a ton of flies that work. <laughs> a lot of the marabou flies like popsicles and hobo yeah. spy. Uh, I'm sorry. Hobo space. Yeah. Those um, are probably the two I fish the most on. The, there's a lot of leeches and I fish the hobo spay a lot, but hobo spay ends up looking leechy anyway. Like once it's well, all it is. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially the commercially tied ones. Yeah, you know they're not. Yeah, they're not as not. When I say full bodied, I just mean they have a a fuller profile than the commercially tied one. But the, but the, you know they work, and like you said, it it kind of looks like a leech. And I've kind of yeah. turned it into a joke on my show that that's kind of all I fish is leeches, and it's but it's kind of true. I I love it. So it's my go to. Like I'm typically throwing a leech on first. I like to swing flies too. And, you know, that's, if I can't, if I'm going to go fishing and I got just a couple hours or something, I'm going to go find somewhere where I can swing a fly. And usually it's a leech, but I'll, yeah. I'll bust out of some other stuff too every once in a while if I'm feeling creative, but yeah, well, try I feel throwing confident. Small, try throwing a sculpting pattern out there because it works really well. Yeah. Uh, and of course you're going to have all the young salmon that are hatching. And okay. so, so do you think, tie do you tie a bait fish pattern that imitates the the salmon fry too, or are you just um, kind of talking about I a, just a, tie a alvin, small, a, a alvin I or, just, or whatever? No, I hardly fish alvins. They, they those work, of course. Mm-hmm. We we sell a ton of them, but no, I just use a small version of my you name it. Oh yeah, you don't put like any like purple marks on it, or maybe use purple <laughs> squirrel or something like that. No, 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 they're not looking for. No, they're just seeing some little fish swimming down the river and they grab it you know so i mean you can get as la- as elaborate as you want i just i have my olive and white little squirrel fly my you name it and i've caught 
a lot of fish on that, and especially um, before the before and after the egg, the salmon egg drop. Okay. And especially in the spring, it can be crazy good. You ever fish any dries or stimulators or anything like anything? Oh, like I used that? to. Yeah. Well, yeah. on you know when I fished more for half pounders, and and that mm-hmm. time of the year, I'm I'm often striper fishing anymore. But um, but July, August, September, used to fish caddis patterns all the time. You would see sometimes you know anywhere from three to ten fish working on caddis in the evening. So and it still can be productive but sometimes. You can run into uh, a group of fish that are working in July, August, September, and, and most definitely catch them on dry flies in the evening. Yeah, I've never definitely never done that on the American. Yeah, yeah, no, you can still do it. It used to be crazy good, of course. <laughs> so, is would you call would you say the American's like your number one river for guide your guide service, or, or what is. other what other waters I, I, do you I fish? Spend most, I spend most of the time most of my time on the American. Yeah, but you know, I do have a captain's license, and I I fish the Delta, I fish oh. the Feather, I fish the Lower Yuba. So I just kind of bounce around. Is it just depending on what what's hot or what the what your what your, your clients want to do? Yeah, kind kind of a combination. Yeah, we kind can. of a combination. A lot of times, uh, um, in my jet boat, I'll just take one person. It's not a very big jet boat. I can I can take two people out there, and I've done that plenty of times. But mostly with with fishermen who are good casters, because it's it's just it's just a small boat. So mm. um, I I just I mostly strive to take one person out. Yeah. Man, that's that's interesting. I've never done a guide service solo. It's probably just because I'm broke. <laughs> okay, I got to split the cost with somebody else. But, no, it winds yeah. up being you know, if you hire you know somebody who has a jack boat these days, it's mm-hmm. about six six hundred six hundred fifty dollars. Yeah, totally. You're, you split that. That's three hundred bucks. So yeah, that's the only, way, these, only way I can afford it, man. <laughs> well, I do these. I I like to do these. I call them fishing with Andy trips. It's exactly. 350 bucks and we go fishing for the day. Yeah. That's the, I'm going to hook up with you for one of those soon. I've been meaning to, cause I know you do those and that's a really good deal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, it works for me too, you know? So yeah. Well, I, like I, keep, I keep looking for a bigger boat every time. Uh, Sarah, my sweetheart of, of 40 plus years, huh? She'll see me on the uh, internet, like I'll be laying in bed early in the morning. Yeah, and she'll wake up and she says, "What are you looking at? Boats?" I go, "Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <it's> just boat, <laughs> cruising for boats." Yeah. Well, we try. You know, I don't have a lot of money, so it's I'll find a good deal, and if I get a larger boat, then for sure I'll I'll be more comfortable taking you know two people out. And yeah. like well, I said, I still take two people out, but. You talked about if you know if you see somebody catching fish on the river, watch what they're doing and stuff. And I like I like when my guide fishes with me. You know, like I don't I don't. Some people just want them to to row or drive the boat or whatever and tell them what to yeah. do. Like I like giving it up to them for a minute and like you know however long and watching them cast, watching them fish, you know, like all the nuances and stuff. And yeah, I I'm I agree with you. I do that all the time if I go fishing with uh, a guide friend or yeah. or or somebody, a guide I don't know. I, I, I want to see what they're doing. Yeah, man, for sure. You pick up. And I don't, you, and you I've been fishing long stuff. enough. Yeah. And I've been fishing long enough. I don't need to catch fish all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I understand, you know, a lot of people, they, they, they get one trip a year and they want to catch fish. And I understand that. Yeah, you know, yeah. They work real hard. People work their asses off and yeah. they have little time to, to enjoy a river <laughs> And there is a chance that you pay a guide and you go out with them for eight hours or whatever the whole day and you don't get into a fish. That's, well, that you, happens, I've had that happen. You know? yeah, yeah, absolutely. There, there's no, there are no guarantees. Yeah. And, and none of us, trust me, none of the guides are feeling happy with themselves <laughs> no, when I, they I, don't catch don't find fish for you and uh, i know i know it man you guys you see it happen i've been on those trips and you see the guy just kicking into overdrive for like the last three hours of the trip yeah you know, trying so hard you know to, to get you into something and you know i learn i learn from failure better than anything else personally 
So those mm-hmm. trips, those trips have taught me a lot. You know, I, I, I don't, I don't take it for granted. So I just like fishing too. You know, I'm happy with one, like one is, is like, hell yeah, I got one, you know, yeah. but I try, I try to make the best of the ones where I get skunked too, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, so we talked about Keeney's, you know, coming to an end, but another bummer is that the, the California fly fisher magazine, local magazine kind of like is, is coming to an end too. It has um, to, or, or it already did. Yeah. Right. It already did. Yeah. It's no longer yeah. in publication. How did you end up contributing to that? I was, I was always kind of su- surprised and excited to see you in as like the, the featured tire in there, you know, they show oh, like the, Oh uh, God, how did that start? I, I was encouraged by Bill Carnazzo okay. to submit. And so I talked to Richard and I sent one in and gosh, you know, and, it, he liked it, and so that's that's kind of how I got into it. You, su- you, submit, you submit the stuff in there for him. I didn't realize that. Well, I did. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't know what, what else to do. So yeah. Bill said, hey, go talk to Richard, and I did. And Richard said, well, submit something, and then we'll, you know, I'll take a look at it. And, yeah. and so that's how the whole thing started. I mean, we're getting kind of niche because this is, I mean, anybody in the world can listen to this podcast, and we're talking about a pretty small local local magazine but it was yeah. always like it, i was i loved it full of great info about the stuff that i'm doing like my local area right and i was subscribed yeah. subscribed for a long time i i hung out hung on to all the, the issues i got i got them all you know in a drawer you know that i'll never i doubt i'll ever get rid of there's tons of great stuff in there and i, I always have a it's a hard it's a hard topic to talk about on the podcast tie-in flies you know like it's like it's kind of more of a visual medium yeah, and, and it's been fun. Like this is like I'm working on the third season of the show, right? So I've only done two seasons, and each one had twelve episodes. And I'm just kind of getting more into, you know, meeting the person, and then we we get into talking about tying. It's always kind of interesting to hear how people talk about it, how they describe tying flies, and the thing that I dug the write ups that you would do. They were kind of poetic in a way, you know what I mean? That you would do in in the in the California fly fishery. You, you get a single photo of this fly right like Mm -hmm. a a nice photo and then like a a description of it not like a hey you have to do this 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 like a recipe step by step it was kind of like somebody talking to you explaining in conversation you know well i'm 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 glad that came across that way so that that's that's cool yeah man that's cool i'll try to i'll try to include that in the show notes if i can dig up that you know dig up one of those issues that you're in and share a picture of it or something well if 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 you yeah i i have lots of copies if you need one (laughs) if i can't find it i might be might be bugging you yeah i can Um, dig through there and because i'd love i'd love a photo a nice photo of the you name it for this show too this to share to show oh yeah sure sure i'll i can send you one cool yeah i'll bug you about it i'll remind you I only got a couple more questions for you. And I always like to ask guides and, and, and people who fish all the time if they have any like bucket list fishing destinations that they haven't been able to check off the uh, list yet. What do you where, yeah, where do you want to go? Oh, I I'd love to go to somewhere like Argentina or Bolivia and fish for Golden Dorado. Oh yeah, that looks so rad. <laughs> you, you always see yeah. them in like some skinny fast water too. And then they yeah. pull, pull out these gi- giants. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's a lot like striper fishing, so it's right. You know, it fits. Okay. It's perfect for me. I, I've always wanted to do that. If 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 I could swing a a trip, yeah, that you know, my, that would be my bucket list trip. I, I feel like I've seen the Keeney's newsletter pushing a, one of those trips. You haven't been able to sneak sneak along on one of those like uh, sh- well, shop getaways. Time, yeah, no, yeah, it just didn't work out that time. I oh yeah, yeah, and. Uh, but you know what? Maybe working with the other shop now, working at Fly Fishing Specialties, perhaps I can put something together and yeah. and host a trip. That's the only way I could go. I certainly oh, can't yeah. afford to do it on my income, but Man. yeah, hosting would be rad. Maybe a host. Yeah, yeah, that 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 would be that would be my bucket list trip. I mean, I've done a lot of things. I've caught tarpon, permit, snook, yeah. bonefish. I've never really had any interest in going after sailfish or. Oh yeah, Wahoo would be pretty cool. Any any interest in the mako shark on the fly stuff? Like uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I would rather go for 
uh, golden Dorado first before yeah. I went for, for any shark species myself. Yeah. So. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get psyched up to go look for leopard sharks on the fly down in the bay. I always see people posting those. It looks like it'd be a, a ton of fun. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. You can just wait for them. Yeah. That's all I got, man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't have legs, no boat. We, we had one customer that used to come in the Keeneys for years and that was one of his favorite things to do. And he would show me pictures of the leopard shark that he would, he would never tell me what, little beachy was catching them off yeah, yeah uh, this top secret info i've definitely yeah I've definitely uh, hunted around for that stuff too they're tight-lipped yeah. yeah yeah i'm pretty open myself you know you know there are guides who you know unless you pay you pay them and i understand that i mean that's how they make sure. their living yeah. but I've, I've always been pretty open with my knowledge and and i've, I've never held back on anybody who hired me you know because they they had their own boat and they were going to learn the water and then i would run into them and that certainly is what happens but you know i'm just just that kind of guy you know i'll yeah. i'll teach you everything i know I, I don't hold back so yeah what's the saying like you raise the water you raise all ships or something something like <laughs> yeah. that right like yeah i feel like it, it's the same with podcasting dude like i feel like there's like this unseen competition or something but i don't look at it i don't have a, a podcasting rivals or anything like that you know what i mean like, uh-huh. I, it's not like i would i would love to have other podcast guests you know people hosts of other shows on and, and go on other shows and just kind of yeah spread the spread the love around you know i think it mm-hmm. works better i think it works better that way I, i'm a musician you know i've been a musician oh, my whole okay. life and yeah. and you know um that is a very competitive world you know you don't want to you know you don't you for you, a lot of bands you know are just it's it's a fight right you know of getting attention and you know mm-hmm. sharing that attention you know is tough yeah I, re- I really do think that you know the uh, the more positivity that you spread around and stuff comes back right and yep. you know it doesn't mean that you can't lie a little bit as a fisherman you know we all do Oh yeah, I, I mean I don't I would, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, like I said, if you're in my boat, I'm taking you to whoever you have the best possibility of yeah. catching fish, and uh, I don't care if you have your own boat or not. I mean, you're you're hiring me to do a job, and so yeah. so I share it. If I don't want to share it with you, I should do something else. Yeah. Well, I haven't been on your boat, but in the shop and on the river casting and stuff, you've been super open about stuff. So I can attest to that and always helpful. You know, early in the interview, you you mentioned being from Michigan. You were born in Michigan? I was. I was born in Detroit. Yeah. When did you move out here? I moved out to California in 79, two months out of high school. Oh, wow. Just took off. Just solo or what? Well, no, my aunt and uncle taught at Yuba College. Okay, yeah. Yeah, my uncle taught marketing, and my aunt taught the Lamont's birth method. And, oh, wow. yeah, so my sophomore year in high school, they came out to visit. We went to Greenfield Village and Henry Ford Museum, and and they asked me if I wanted to come out after I finished high school. And I said, well, I'll, I'll think about it. And that's exactly what I did. So mm-hmm. I, I moved out in 79. I went to Yuba College, got my associates, my AA. And then in 82, I moved to Sacramento to work on my BA and my MA at Sacramento State University. And, and there I concentrated in painting and printmaking. Cool. So, yeah, so I've been in Sacramento ever since 82. Were you steelhead fishing out in Michigan for all the the, no, the no. highly contentious steelhead that everybody likes no, to argue about out no, there? No, not at all. I, no. I did no no steelhead, no nothing trout. I fished yeah. for pike, walleye, walleye yeah. smallmouth, largemouth, perch, white bass. They were fun. That was probably the fish that I really got into my last yeah. year and a half of being a teenager in Michigan. I had a little boat and I learned that. And that was like fishing for stripers, really. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, oh, cool. yeah. Yeah. I've been all over. I've been to 40 states or something. I somehow passed up. I haven't been in Michigan ever. Oh. Ba- ba- passed that up. 
passed up a lot of the south. I haven't been to Alaska, so I got some. I got some places to go still. I really yeah. want to go. Out, I want to go out to Michigan though. It's it's a beautiful state. I mean, it's so green, so lush. Lot water everywhere, fish everywhere. Yeah. Well, I love steelhead, and, and like you always see the Michigan stuff, and everybody argues okay. about it. And I want to go out there and give it a shot. You know. Yeah, yeah. I would like to too. I yeah. every time I go back to visit family because they're all still there. Oh yeah. And but I don't see my family a whole lot, so when I go there, I'm I I don't take any fishing gear with me. Gotta go out just one day, man. Just take one yeah. day. I think the next time I go, that's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> so I, I got one more question for you, and not fishing right. related at all. But have you ever had a paranormal experience? Paranormal? Mm. Supernatural? Anything weird like that? Weird? High strangeness? I don't know. Life is that way all the time to me. <laughs> that's, that's a good answer. I like that. <laughs> Life is fucking weird, especially especially these days, man. It's just getting weirder and weirder. Yeah, yeah. So I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I, I don't get a lot of um, stories from that question. Just so you know. <laughs> I like. Yeah, the, no, I like no, to... I, I, yeah, I can't think of any. Thing in particular, I yeah, I've got I've gotten a few, you know, like what? I don't know, you know, ghost stories and stuff like that. Oh, okay, finding dead no. bodies, a lot of fishermen find I, dead bodies, man. No, I I never found it. Well, I mean, I I kind of found a dead body once. See, I, yeah, I was fishing uh, for stripers on the American and. I noticed the boat going around in circles just above the Howe Avenue launch. And no I went shit. over there and they said, they're looking for a little kid that went down. Oh my God. No shit. Yeah. And uh, I thought you meant like a boat that was just going around in circles with nobody in it or something. No, but no. They were uh, looking for somebody. No, they were looking for this little, little, this kid. And, uh, mm. and they, they were stirring up the water with their jet pump and the ambulance showed up at the launch and he went to talk to them and the water cleared up real quick and i could see this little boy face down on the bottom oh you saw him down there oh, yeah man. yeah well i dived down i had my friend control the boat and i just dived in and i i went down to him and mm -hmm. freaked out and came back up oh uh, well yeah, yeah, man, shit. Well, I composed myself, and then yeah. I went down and brought him up to the surface, and we we got him in the boat and yeah. took him over to the ambulance, but he was gone. And that is heavy. You know what? That's yeah. one of the weird things is it was kind of heavy, but it also it didn't. I I expected it more to freak me out or something, but it huh. just was just like I don't know it. it yeah. yeah. Well, you, you, yeah, you deal with things however you deal with them, man. Yeah. 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 That is crazy. I mean, you hear every year accidents here on the American. It gets a lot of swimmer traffic, a lot of raft traffic oh, yeah. in, in the summer, like a lot of these I, met, metro rivers do, you know? And yeah. Well, I've saved a couple people over the years. Have you? Yeah, I'm not yep. surprised. Yeah. Saved a couple people, and I've also saved two swallows. Oh, yeah. Swallows yeah. that were going down? No shit. Yeah, yeah. One time I was fishing for stripers upper Watt. Yeah. And I saw this thing flapping in the water and I, I thought it was a bat. It looked like a bat. Oh, yeah, bat. Yeah. And I went over to it and it was a swallow. Yeah. And it kept swimming away from the boat. And finally, it was so tired, it was ready to, it looked yeah. like it was ready to go down under. Yeah. And so I was able to get it. And That's the thing was, <laughs> oh, it was convulsing, just shaking terribly, hypothermia. Yeah. And so I stuck it under my armpit and yeah. I, for about an hour and then it stopped shaking and then it stood, then it, you know, would sit on my shoulder. And then I, <laughs> I finally, you know, it kind of walked down towards my hand and I, yeah. and I petted it and it just looked at me and then I held my hand out and it took off. Yeah. So that's one of the coolest things that ever that happened cool. to me in my life. So I'm a, so. I'm a, I think of myself as an amateur birder. Uh -huh. It'll soon be a full-on birder, you know, in 10, 20 years. Um, yeah. It's ha it's half of the stuff I enjoy about being out on the river, man. I like looking at the birds, too. And a striper would have gobbled that sucker right up, don't you think? Well, it, it certainly had the potential. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. The second one I said was right by the the 
water plant below Howe Avenue. Same same situation. I think they just, you know, flew too low and wound up in the water. And and anyways, I was lucky enough to be there and same type of thing happened and it flew off. So th- those are the cool things that can happen. In yeah. one life. That, is, that is cool. <laughs> my, my buddy saved a seagull one time fishing for when we were crabbing off the Pacific up here. Uh-huh. Mm. Well, I mean, he wouldn't have had to save it if he didn't hook it. If he didn't hook oh. it, <laughs> he ended up saving it. So that's good. Uh, yeah. It flew away. Yeah, I've accidentally hooked a pelican or two while fishing oh. in Mexico. No shit. I'd feel I'd feel so bad about that. I love a pelican. Yeah. Well, you know, you're fishing, and the next thing, you know, they're diving all around, yeah, and yeah. You know, and, and, and boy, they're, they're pretty nasty. You don't want anything to pelican that's pissed off. Yeah, totally. I've seen them get, get, get pissy on the pier before, you know, Yeah, Yeah, yeah. for sure. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Andy, that's all I got for you, man. I appreciate you making time for me and and doing this interview and we gotta, we gotta get together and tie up some, you name it, tubes, man. I'd love to do it. I'd love to do it. And I'd love to go fish with you. So you're gonna okay. hear, you're gonna hear from me soon and all right uh, man well, I look forward to it wow i didn't realize how long i sat on that interview we recorded it in december of last year and now it's summertime i'm happy that it's finally out there on the internet airwaves thanks again to andy for being my guest the local sacramento fly fishing scene wouldn't be the same without him i'm thankful we crossed paths and have gotten to know each other a little bit i still haven't met up with andy to tie his you name it fly on a tube like we talked about but I'm going to make that happen soon, and I will report back with the results. Please do yourself a favor and hire him to take you fishing, or to get some pointers on your casting. You won't be sorry. I'll put the best ways to contact him in the show notes. And pardon me, but I completely neglected to include any local high strangeness in this episode. Lucky for you, there is no time limit on my podcast, so I'm going to tack on a few things to the end here. The first one is actually a spot that I'll often go to look for shad in the summer an area on the lower American River we call Paradise Beach. I go there because it's supposedly haunted, and I want to catch fish with other skeletons and ghosts like me. It's more popular as a swimming hole for students at CSUS, but there's plenty of fishing to be done there too, and usually plenty of room to find a spot far enough from other people to enjoy yourself. Anyways, it's said that a restless spirit described as a ghastly drowned man wanders the shoreline. I have no personal encounters to report, but beware. I briefly talked trash on Old Sacramento earlier in this episode, but I can't finish this without mentioning the underground tunnel system that exists below the town. Of course, it's said to be haunted, but if you've learned anything about me over the last couple seasons of this show, you know that the Tartaria subject, or theory, or whatever it is, is one of my favorites. I love to research seemingly outlandish tales of hidden history, stuff that usually just spurs responses of laughter or name-calling in my direction if I send my friends links to stuff I'm reading. The official story is that the original city was flooded out and buried by the near Sacramento River. But just let me tie this into the very broad Tartaria theory, okay? Maybe the original Sacramento was buried by the same mud flood that all the Tartaria theorists point to and covered up with the stories of the river flood. Would you let me have this one thing, please? It's local, and I want very badly to have a local conspiracy thing to geek out on. The timeline pretty much matches up with all the other Tartaria-related tales as the flood I'm trying to erroneously connect to this wild-ass theory happened in the 1850s. And, just to catch you up in case you aren't into that subject or haven't heard me babble about it on previous episodes, the theory of Tartaria isn't just about the area on old maps labeled as Tartaria, it's more of a far-reaching theory that weaves in a bunch of weird things, like the idea that there's been multiple global reset scenarios, the most recent happening in the late 1800s, early 1900s. The old world architecture that survived the reset is reclaimed by some type of elite class that has knowledge of this cycle of resets and has means to weather them or sometimes purposely destroyed by things like fires to cover up the truth. I know I sound insane saying this, but remember, it's not my theory, okay? I just like reading about it and some of it actually makes sense to me. Start researching the world's fairs and maybe you'll cross over to the weird side of history with me. If you're interested, you can take tours of the underground tunnel system in Sacramento. I bet you wherever you live probably has some kind of underground city too. Start Googling that shit. You're either going to end up down the rabbit hole or calling me a crazy idiot. I'm okay with either. 
I think I give a care. Anyways, I'm going to end this episode with what might be the most well-known spooky place in town, Dyer Lane. It's a road not too far from fly fishing specialties in Citrus Heights, which is a suburb of Sacramento, and it's considered one of the most haunted roads in the area. I didn't even know roads could be haunted until I heard about Dyer Lane. It has a history of violent incidents, including murders, suicides, and other deadly accidents dating all the way back to the 1800s before the mud flood that buried Old Sacramento. I'll read a little bit from our local paper, The Sacramento Bee. Dyer Lane is definitely haunted. That's according to Paul Dale Roberts, who has spent more than a decade hunting ghosts after work and on weekends in and around Sacramento. Calling it one of the most active paranormal sites in the region, he said that evidence from several investigations and the testimonies of several residents living near the lightly traveled road all but confirm it. Everybody seems to believe that there is some kind of haunting activity. Everybody had a different story, Robert said. It's just one story after another at Dyer Lane. Part of the reason why Dyer Lane is considered haunted is because the narrow, tree-lined rural road has been the setting of dozens of spooky tales, urban legends, and unexplained phenomena for generations. Ghost hitchhikers, satanic cults, spectral farmers plowing the tall grass lining the road. Spectral farmers is a great band name, by the way. Some of the stories are graphic and disturbing. One tells of a pair of witches who were practicing their witchcraft in the nearby field. After they were assaulted and killed one night by a group of local boys, legend says they still haunt the rural road. Which murder was still legal back in those days? Another story tells of a police officer who was shot and killed during a high-speed chase down the road. Robert said that some people claim a ghostly police car will sometimes appear behind them, racing down the road with its lights on before evaporating, a legend that several locals have attempted to document on camera. Ghost Cop? Also a great band name. Here are just a few more incidents that have happened on Dyer Lane. The body of a 28-year-old woman who was killed by her roommate was dumped in the bushes near Dyer Lane. Her body was found wrapped in an inflatable mattress on the side of the road, which is unfortunately often littered with trash and debris. In 1995, a 20-year-old man was shot and killed execution style on Dyer Lane by an acquaintance he was smoking marijuana with on the mostly deserted road. In March of 1985, a teenager was stabbed to death during a vicious midnight gang fight between young punk rockers and conventional high school students on the secluded street. According to B articles at the time, more than 80 students showed up to the melee, which had been prearranged after bad blood had developed during a dance at Rio Linda High School earlier in the month. All your little legends and myths have some type of foundation of truth to it, Roberts said. Roberts and a local ghost hunting group went to the cursed road at dusk to see if they could pick up on any unearthly sightings. It was a very successful investigation. Their digital recorders picked up several electronic voice phenomena, sounds on recordings interpreted as voices of spirits, even with the windy conditions. When one investigator asked if anyone was out in the field, their recordings picked up what sounded like a distant voice saying, help me. Another one later said, I'm here. The group also reported the presence of several ghosts and residual energy from the past replaying itself. A farmer in overalls in the field, a boy playing with a toy ball and horse, a woman in a white prom dress walking down the road holding a pair of heels in her hand. Creepiest of all, perhaps, was the alleged sighting of a tall figure cloaked in black silk fabric, a kind of death angel, walking just under the trees. I haven't been there, so I can't give you any first-hand account of any high strangeness, but these tales have been thrown around for as long as I've lived in the area. So there you have it. I'm done with the episode about the river that I fish the most with a local friend who's been fishing it for way longer and knows way more than I do about how to fish it successfully. Thanks for listening. I mean that. I appreciate every last one of you for tuning in. You have successfully completed one of your five streams. I'll leave you with a couple content suggestions like I've been doing with the other episodes of this season. Stay tuned for another episode coming out later this month. Hey, how about that? This one is actually topical to the episode. A book called The Founding Fish by John McPhee. It's a book all about American shad. McPhee, a shad fisherman himself, recounts the shad's cameo role in the lives of George Washington and Henry David Thoreau. He fishes with and visits the laboratories of famous ichthyologists. He takes instruction in the making of shad darts from a master of the art, and he cooks shad in a variety of ways, delectably explained at the end of the book. 
Mostly, though, he goes fishing for shad in various North American rivers, and he fishes the same way he writes books, avidly and intensely. He wants to know everything about the fish he's after, its history, its habits, its place in the cosmos. If American Shad interests you, I highly encourage you to find a copy and give it a read. Okay, the next one is not related to the episode, but I love it very much. It's Grant Cameron's Paranormal UFO Consciousness Podcast. That name is a mouthful, but it does capture the spirit of the show. Grant's podcast looks at all things dealing with UFOs, UAPs, the paranormal, consciousness, spirituality, the nature of reality, and psychedelics. It looks for answers to the question, what is really going on and where do we go from here? He's my favorite personality in the world of UFO researchers and seems to genuinely care about finding the truth without any ulterior motives. Sure, he sells books, but in my opinion, none of them are exploitative cash craps. I don't even think they sell many copies, unfortunately. Grant is just a person who wants to understand the phenomenon and he has decided to take us on his journey of research. He's pretty well known in the UFO community and has experienced some pretty heavy moments firsthand. From a supernatural portal in Shasta, to the story of being with Chris Bledsoe when his dog had a strange supernatural accident and healing, to witnessing the widely reported Charlie Red Star UFO sighting in Canada. He's had boots on the ground for years now. He's one of the few people that I trust in the UFO world where it's hard to trust anything. Please do yourself a favor and give Grant a listen. This episode of Secret Society of Fly Tires would not be possible without our sponsors. They say that sex sells, and they're right. Just listen to this. Pretty cool, right? Am I right? Genuinely, am I? I've never had sexual intercourse, and with any luck, I never will. And it's all thanks to my new underwear. That's right. They now make underwear that makes you not want to have sex. It's extremely tight and constricting, and it cuts off most of the circulation to my groin. And I love it. It feels terrible, but it makes me have no interest in whatever these two freaks are doing. Just listen to them. They sound like a couple of real hogs rooting around in the slop. No thank you. None of that for me, please. Not with my new sex drive eliminating undergarments. Now, instead of wasting my time and energy thinking about nudity or fantasizing about consensual lovemaking with a cartoon character, I just put on my special undies and devote myself to working really hard to make my boss more money. Eliminating my sexual interests has resulted in a huge boost in my productivity. I work overtime nearly every day. I'm getting projects done on time and under budget. I have not received a raise, but my boss is making more money because of my diligence and it's all thanks to my 30 pairs of groin crushing underwear i know i haven't said the exact name of this product yet and there's a good reason for that it doesn't have a name yet they're made by a brand new company and they're still figuring things out so cut them some slack while you cut off the circulation to your nards and focus on the important things in life like working hard doing extra work staying late at work and earning more money for the c-level executives at your place of employment because when you really think about it. Life isn't about falling in love and mushing your naked body against another person's naked body. It's about productivity, profit margins, customer loyalty, increasing marketing budgets, year-over-year growth, and stock buybacks. Wow, listen to them go. What an absolute waste. Please note that this is not a real advertisement, and the company, brand, entity, or product mentioned in the preceding ad in no way endorses, agrees with, or knows about this podcast.